Uh, anybody else sing in the shower? <laughs> Let me see your hands. Come on. I mean, you sound better in the shower, don't you? I sound good in the shower. Not anywhere else, but I do. I mentioned that this is a good shower song. You can sing this in the shower. And somebody after the first service said, yeah, but you got to change the words. you got to sing, I wash by faith. So, If you'd like to hold your Bible up, you're invited to do that. This is our declaration each week that we live under the authority of God and His Word. This is my Bible. God's holy word. It's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It is inerrant. It is infallible. It is authoritative. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. The fire shut up in my bones. I must speak it. It is bread for my soul. I am ready to receive it. Today we uh, continue our study of the book of Psalms, and we are at Psalm 139. When you voted for your favorite Psalms, this was number four on the list, I think. We're going we're gonna to cover the whole Psalm, but I'm going to read right now the first four verses of Psalm 139. This was written by King David. Verse 1, O Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word on my mouth, on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. Thank you. you may be seated. When I was a kid, I uh, delivered the Columbus Dispatch. Anybody else deliver the dispatch? Let me look at that. A good group of people. I started when I was nine. Uh, my dad said, Son, if you want to eat, you got to work. I said, They don't take paper boys unless they're 12. He, he said, I'll take care of that. Well, after delivering papers, I always read the comics. And one of my favorites was Charlie Brown. And uh, one day, Charlie went to go see Lucy for some psychiatric help. <laughs> and she said, what's your problem, Charlie? And he said, well, I think I have an inferiority complex. She said, oh, you don't have an inferiority complex. He said, I don't. She said, no, you're just inferior. <laughs> now, the reality is we all share a deep need to feel wanted to feel loved, to feel like we matter. Yet the enemy constantly tells us we're inferior, we're insignificant, we're unlovable, we're worthless, we're unattractive, we're inadequate, we're forgotten, we're worn out, we're broken, we're shameful, we're ugly, we will never fit in. Tells us that we are pointless, without value, purposeless, and hopelessly insignificant. Carl Sagan, narrator of the Cosmos, which was the most widely watched television series in public television history, an atheist, this is what he said about you. He said, you and everything about you is nothing more than a tiny speck of dust suspended on a sunbeam. Woo, that makes me feel good. God, on the other hand, says that you are deeply significant. David, in this psalm, gives, in essence, a secret of his success, a secret of his uh, resilience. David went through a lot of stuff. Bad stuff, hard stuff, difficult stuff. And yet he came through with a great attitude because he understood who he was in light of who God is. And when you understand who you are in light of who God is, you can be like David and say, I am significant. Turn to the person next to you and uh, say those words, I am significant. 
That's the theme of this psalm, and I think that's why it's so popular. And there are six aspects of being significant that we're going to look at as we walk through this psalm. Number one, you and I, we are significant because God knows me. David said, God knows me. We just read these verses. You've searched me. You know me. You know my sitting down, my rising up. You understand my thoughts. You comprehend my path. You are acquainted with my ways. Uh, Whatever words come out of my mouth, even before I say it, you know it. There's something about being known that helps you feel significant. Uh, When you are the, the smallest skinniest kid starting high school and you have thick glasses, gym class can be a nightmare. Because if no one knows you, uh, it can be very difficult. My first day of school in high school had the football coach as our uh, gym teacher, and uh, we had two senior guys, football players in there. And so he, made, he handed them a ball He made them captains. He said, you pick up teams, and uh, I've got some work to do. And he went and he watched film for the upcoming football game. Well, they didn't know me. So they didn't pick me till near the end. It was a nightmare. I never saw the ball. (laughs) But eight weeks later... My, the class changed, and the basketball coach became the gym teacher. And it just so happened that when I was in middle school, I was one of the better basketball players in our city, and he had scouted me. Now, that changed when puberty happened to everyone else, and <laughs> they all grew a foot and mustaches, and, and I didn't. I switched to wrestling at that point, Uh, but he knew me, and he let me pick one of the teams. I got to see the ball. (laughs) What was the difference? He knew me. I want you to understand something. God knows you. He gets you. He understands you. Believe it or not, you make sense to him. When you are feeling the lies of insignificance swirling around in your head, you need to stop and go, no, I am significant because God knows me. Number two, I'm significant, David says, because God is with me. God is with me. Uh, the first thing he says is, God has his hand on my life. Verse 5 and 6, he says, You've hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. I call it the Emmanuel factor in the Old Testament. And that is a principle that um, the word Emmanuel is Hebrew. It means L is God, whenever you read that, L is God, Emmanuel, God with us, God with me. And if you start with Joseph, you'll find that jo- the, the scripture says on four occasions that Joseph was successful, Joseph was blessed as a, a slave and then as a prisoner because it says the Lord was with him. Moses I was called to deliver the the Israel uh, nation from slavery in Egypt. And Moses succeeded because he said, God, I'm not going unless you go with me. God promised Joshua he would be able to follow Moses successfully and lead uh, the Israel nation through the Jordan River at flood time to defeat the unbeatable nation of Jericho and to begin to take the promised land. And God said, you can do it because I am with you. The scripture says that David was able to defeat Goliath and was undefeated as a general uh, after that 
because the Lord, it says, the Lord was with him. Nehemiah said that the secret of his success in, in the pagan king, not only allowing him to leave his post, but go to Israel and be fully supplied and be protected, he says, because the good hand of the Lord was upon me. David is saying, I am significant. God is with me. His hand is on my life. You know, you can go into really difficult situations with confidence if you know God's with you. Second thing he says is God is with me no matter where I go. God is with me no matter where I go. Verse 7 through 10, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Now, this is a, a poem. He's speaking. Uh, he's exaggerating some of these terms. But the idea is no matter where I go, God is with me. Uh, in Las Vegas, we ran a program. We had college students come and help us in the summer, and then we had uh, high school students come and spend a week with us. And we housed them down in a, a rotten part of town. Uh, they were actually prostitutes right outside their door. And while we were recruiting uh, the college students to spend the summer, we had 20 my last summer there, and we had 200 high school students come for a week. I was surprised at the response of parents who would say, I'm not going to let Junior go because he's not going to be, I don't know that he's going to be safe there. Well, you know what I found? The safest place on the planet is with God. And Junior's a lot safer in Las Vegas in a nasty neighborhood if he's with God than he is in a nice, safe suburb if, if he's not with God. You, Andrew and I, uh, we got into some very, very interesting situations. Some of you have been in the military. Some of you have uh, worked in the police department. And you've been in very interesting situations. And there's just that thing that when God is with you, you don't have to be afraid. Interesting, uh, God promised... In Isaiah, he says, fear not, for I am with you. Be, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed, uh, for I am your God and I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will withhold you with the right hand of my righteousness. I am with you. You don't have to be afraid. The uh, third aspect of this is God's with me through the darkest times of my life. Verse 11 and 12, he says... If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light unto me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, nor the light, but the light shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. You know, I think when we get to heaven, and I'm looking forward to this part, we're going to get to see some type of video of scenes from our lives where we will actually see the angels and the demons and everything that's actually going on there. And what I, I believe with all my heart, look at me, that you will see is that the toughest times of your life, God was there. Uh, sometimes we do this prayer exercise where we help people get freedom from some stuff in their past, and I uh, had a, a college professor that I was praying with, and he was get, just stuck in anxiety and depression. And I said, well, let's just ask God to show you when this started and why it started and where he was in that process. And we began to pray, and in one of those things that only God does, we both kind of saw a vision of the same thing at the same time him as a little boy 
five-year-old boy. He said, I, I, I'm walking into the living room, and my father is laying on the couch, and there's blood everywhere. He's just been shot, and he's dead. And I said, why don't you ask God where he was that day? And I'll never forget, his face just lit up. He said, oh, my. Oh, my. He's right there. He's got his arm around me. He was there all the time. You know, I don't know what you're going through right now, but I believe that the child of God has God there all the time time the darkest times of your life that poem footprints where there's only one set of footprints in the sand and the person asked why where were you during the hardest times of my life and God said well there's only one set of footprints because I carried you I was there all the time hey you are significant because God knows you, and God is with you. And number three, God made you. God created you. First thing he says is, God made me in the womb, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. He says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Now, remember, this is poetry. He's talking about his, his mom. He says, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I was prescribed and preordained by God way back in my mother's womb. You know, it, it's fascinating to realize that there's 23 unique chromosomes and hundreds of genes that God put together to make you, you. And of all the people on the planet now, billions, and all the people that have ever lived, billions plus, there's never been, there isn't now, and there never will be another you. Your fingerprints tell the story of your uniqueness. Someone calculated that God could have used the 23 chromosomes and hundreds of genes to create from your uh, DNA makeup 300,000 billion different human beings, but he chose to make you, you. Say wow. wow. Say it backwards. <laughs> you know, you, you, you are not the product of your parents' random biological urges. You are the product of an all-wise, all-knowing God. You are not the product of your mom's legal choice. You are the product of Almighty God. You were preordained, prescribed prior to your birth. You know, I just, I have to say this. I don't know how you can say you believe the Bible and be a fan of abortion at the same time. I just don't. I don't know how you can look at a sonogram and see that little person in there and be a fan of abortion. Because God made you, he says, in the mother's womb. Uh, second, not only did God make you, God made you amazing. Turn to the person next to you and go, I, I am amazing. <laughs> look at verse 14. That's what David said. He said, I will praise you because I am Fearfully and wonderfully made, marvelous, talking about himself, are your works, and that my soul knows very well. You know, they talk about the seven wonders of the world, 
But then we'll talk about the most wonderful wonder of the world, and that is people. People are amazing. I spent a lot of time sitting in hospitals just thinking about the human body and how God put this thing together so complicated, so amazing. You know, the body, if, if, if things are, are, if systems are working well, heals itself. Think about it, 100 million receptors in your eyes so that you can see a sunset. 24,000 fibers in your ear. Now, I'm getting older. A couple of those get longer and occasionally. <laughs> fibers in your ear so that you can hear. God has given you a unique ability to speak and communicate. There are 500 muscles, 200 bones, 7 miles of nerve fibers synchronized so that you can walk, talk, run, hold a fork, type a keyboard, kiss your mate. God gave you a heart that beats every second, hour after hour, day after day, 36 million beats a year. You have 60,000 miles of veins and arteries pumping 600 gallons of blood. Wow. Your skin never rusts. Your brain is the most complex structure in the universe. You have 13. 15 million nerve cells in your brain containing 1,000 billion billion protein molecules that enable you to store, even though we can't, aren't very good at retrieving it, every sound, taste, smell, action, and thought you've ever experienced. To protect you and make your life interesting, your body has 4 million pain receptors, uh, sensors, 500,000 tons touch sensors, and 200 temperature sensors. Some of you, your temperature sensors are more sensitive than they, they were. Now, this is the one that blows my mind. You have enough atomic energy within you to destroy any city on the planet and rebuild it again. Say, wow. wow. Say it backwards. Wow. You got the power. Wow. Now, if you just understood how God made you and who you are and how significant you are, you'd get up in the morning and look in the mirror and go, uh-huh. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Wow. No wonder David said, I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. But not only did God make you amazing, God made you a masterpiece. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. He says, For we are his creation. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. Now, if they find anything painted by a master artist, let's say they find a, just a, a doodle from Da Vinci. Or uh, uh, just a, a sketch from Michelangelo. It's worth millions of bucks because it was made by a master. Look at me for a second. You're worth more than that because you were made by the master of masters. You are a stinking masterpiece. <laughs> that word created, created in Christ Jesus, that's the Greek word poema. What's that sound like? Poem. You are God's poem, God's song, God's symphony. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Beautiful music. Say it with me. I am significant. God created you. God knows you. God is 
with you, and God is, this blows my mind, God's thinking about you, and he's praying for you. Now, I don't always think about God, but God is thinking about me. Psalm 139, some of you, he's wondering, why are you not? Why are you making your grocery list right now? That's what, Psalm 139, verse 16, says, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them, verse 17, 18. If I could count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I wake, I am still with you. God is thinking about you. Max Lucado wrote this. He said, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If he had a wallet, your photo would be in it. He sends you flowers every spring, and he sends you a sunrise every morning. Face it, friend, he is crazy about you. God is thinking about you. Uh, but not only is God thinking about you, I think God's thoughts are active. It says in Romans that God is praying for you. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we don't know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. That, that means he is praying for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts and knows the minds of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit prays for us. So does the Son. Hebrews 7, 24, he always, what's Jesus doing in heaven right now? He's living to make intercession, to pray for us. The Spirit and the Son are praying to the Father on your behalf right now. I've got three sons, two daughters-in-law, two grandkids, and sometimes I honestly don't know how to pray for them. And so this is how I pray. I say, God, whatever, whatever Jesus is and the Holy Spirit are praying for them right now, I'm with that. I agree with that. Hey, I got to say, there's, it's a sweet thing to know somebody's praying for you. Our last 10 months have been a journey for my wife and myself and especially my son. And I can tell you, there is something amazing when somebody looks at you and goes, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for your son. Thank you so much for praying for him this week. God's turning physically. He's healing. He's still got a ways to go. We're hoping they'll be here in September. But we feel your prayers. Think about it. As much as I like your prayers, it's crazy to think that, that God the Son, and God, the Spirit, is praying for me. And he's praying for you. I'm significant, David says. God made me. God thinks about me. God is praying for me. God is with me. God knows me. Number five, God is listening to me. David concludes this psalm with this famous prayer, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there's any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. He's offering a prayer. He's saying, in light of all this stuff, God, purify my heart. He prays. And he believes God's listening. In Psalm 17, David said, I called unto you, for you will hear me, O God. God said in Isaiah, it says, it, it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. When I got saved, one of the biggest blessings of being saved was, I felt like there was somebody out there that was listening to me. And uh, I used to run about three miles at night, and I remember I would just start praying because I, I was delighted to know that there was somebody listening to me. Now, I've been married a while, and I've got to confess that I'm not a perfect husband. I know, I know. 
And I have, I know, wow. <laughs> and I have to confess, there's been at least once, if not a hundred times, my wife has said to me, are you listening to me? <laughs> I got good news for you today. There is a God who is in heaven, who is your heavenly Father, who is listening to you. Amen. And he's not only able to hear you, he's able to do something about it. My wife's been in Virginia most of the last 10 months. I find that there's been times I have been talking to the dog. Now, he can hear me. The only words he actually hears are food, treat, walk, no. He can hear me, but he can't do anything about what I'm talking to him about. But you know what's amazing? God not only listens to you, he can do something about it. Why would this be so? Because you are significant to him. He made you. He knows you. He's thinking about you. He's praying for you, and he's listening to you. You are significant. The last thing I want to say about this is not in the Psalms, but it's from the New Testament, and that is Jesus died for me. Because this is all amazing truth, but if you've got to get this one to get... It opens the door to all the rest. Jesus died for me. I love Romans 5, 8. It says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I'm not the most spiritual person that ever lived. And sometimes my prayers aren't all that pretty. And sometimes when stuff happens, this is my prayer. Really? And sometimes I am like, okay, you don't like me, do you? You obviously don't like me. Well, that's debatable whether God likes me or not. But beyond a shadow of a doubt, it is an absolute fact that God loves me. And God loves you. You say, prove it. He already did. God has proven his love for us, and that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. God sent his son because he loves you. Jesus died on a cross because he loves you. Jesus rose again to give you eternal life because God loves you. Uh, 1 Peter, it says that we're not redeemed. Uh, 1 Peter 1, it says, Knowing that you're not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the incorruptible, precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. You know, the Raiders of the Lost Ark was about them finding this chalice that, which didn't happen. But <laughs> the blood of Jesus is the most precious thing. Because it's the only thing that can wash away your sins and, un and bring you new life. And open the door so that you can have an eternal relationship with God. Look at me. I know I'm short, but stick your head up there. <laughs> the undeniable fact is God loves you. Jesus died for you. Even though we are sinners separated from God because of our sins, he still died for us. So that by faith in him, we can have eternal life. I just dumped a bunch of truth on you the last 30 minutes. Now, whenever you hear a lot of truth, your next question is, so what? So, I've told you that according to the Bible, you are significant. Whether you believe that or not, it's a fact. But what's the so what? Number one. 
God knows me. So what? Therefore, stop thinking you are unloved, unimportant, and unwanted. Stop it. It's not true. God knows you. Number two, God is with you. Therefore, choose to not be afraid. God is with you. Choose to not be afraid. Number three, God created me. I'm awesome in Christ. Therefore, get busy. As soon as we're done, go sign up to coach football. <laughs> sign up to help in Awana. We've got 50-some ministries we uh, have identified that folks are involved in uh, through this church. Over 50. There's one for you. Get busy. You got no excuse. God made you awesome. Amazing. Number four. God is thinking of me and praying for me, therefore be encouraged. Do not live this week in discouragement. God is thinking about you. God is praying for you. Number five, God is listening. Therefore, pray. He's listening. If, if you got God's attention, you ought to take advantage of that, my friend. And number six, Jesus died for you. Therefore, get saved. Be forgiven. Receive eternal life. Now, in just a minute, we're going to bow our heads. I'm going to ask you one or two questions. Then we're going to stand and sing. Listen to me. Some of you, you just need to bring your lies of insignificance down here at this altar and leave them here. And accept the truth of who you are in Jesus Christ. Some of you have somebody you love who is just eaten up with lies and you just need to come and pray for them. Some of you have uh, other things you'd like us to pray about. Maybe you want to come and be saved today. This is a great day to be saved. It's Sunday. Good day to be saved. So, when we stand to sing, that's your invitation to respond. Let's bow our heads. And before I pray, I just got one question for you. I wonder who would say with an uplifted hand, thank God this was some truth I needed today, and I'm raising my hand thanking God that he, he gave me the truth I needed today. Would you raise your hands all over here as a way of thanking God? Thank you, God, you gave me some truth I needed today. Thank you, God. You may put him down. Father, I thank you that uh, we don't feel it, but it doesn't change the fact that we are significant to you. And that makes us significant in this universe. May we live in that truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and uh, let's sing this song from the Psalms today. Christine and Cliff Hauser coming today, expressing a desire to uh, take our membership class and become a part of First Baptist. If you think that's a good thing, you can say amen. Amen. You can clap, too. Uh, may God bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. May he give you grace. May he bring you into the state of uh, peace in your heart. Uh, may God use you this week to make a difference in the lives of many others. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you on your way out. If you need to sign up to coach Upward Football or get in another ministry or a life group, stop at the Next Step kiosk on your way out. <laughs>